All right. If you have a bulletin, you've got some of the scriptures that we're going to go through today on this Resurrection Sunday. If you don't and you got your Bible, great. Uh, we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark to start, but I'm excited to share God's Word with you. Why don't we pray and we'll jump right in. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day, Lord, that in the life of the church, we set aside this Sunday, Lord, to remember your death and your resurrection. That, Lord, you suffered on the cross for our sins. That you experienced and descended into the depths of hell itself, experiencing what we deserve. And instead, Lord, you succumbed to death and then conquered death for us. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, because you rose from the dead, so too shall we who believe in you. And so, Lord, we thank you for the hope we have in Jesus this morning. I pray for all those who are here today. I pray, Lord, that you would soften our hearts and open our minds to receive your truth, to understand it. Holy Spirit, give us that understanding we need, and may you be glorified in our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Title is The Cross Revealed, and really the goal of every Easter or Resurrection Sunday sermon is to get to the cross and the resurrection. Interestingly enough, we will get there, Lord willing, but... (laughs) If you've been here more than one Sunday, you know I'm pretty ambitious when it comes to what I expect to cover on a Sunday morning, and most of these messages become a two-part series rather than a one-part sermon. Uh, Can't happen today, all right? I got to stick to it. But I really want to look at two major events that led to the cross and the grave. And they dealt with Jesus' temptation at the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry. And there's some fascinating things we see because the decision to go to the cross for us happened long before the cross. It happened the day of his death. It happened three years before during his temptation in the wilderness. It actually happened in eternity past before God even made the heavens and the earth. God the Son already decided to sacrifice himself for us. But we're going to look at all that today. Uh, I want you to look at Mark's gospel. Where we're at, we're in chapter 1. And in Jesus' life last week, we covered how Jesus was revealed at his baptism. Where he came into the waters, John the Baptist was there. And when Jesus came out of the waters, three witnesses testified to who he was. God the Father spoke audibly from heaven and said, "This," or he says, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So God the Father saying Jesus is his son. He's not some illegitimate child of Mary that everybody for 30 years thought that he was. He wasn't just some son of a carpenter, but he was actually God's only begotten son, born of the Virgin Mary. But then also the Holy Spirit testified by descending on Jesus like a dove that this is the promised one that God has been telling humanity since the beginning of creation that God would send. He promised it through the prophets and he He confirmed it through the Holy Spirit descending upon him at his baptism that this is the Savior, this is the Messiah. And then the third testimony was John the Baptist. That even before Jesus was baptized in the water, as he approached John, John said to everybody around, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So we saw last week at Jesus' baptism that he is the Son, that he is the promised savior and he is the sacrifice that would take away our sins. Such a beautiful picture of who he is and what he came to do for us. And I actually had the honor of this last Good Friday uh, to baptize uh, three members of a family. It's a family who are friends of ours. They have three teenage kids, two sons and one daughter. And right before we went into the frigid water of the ocean, I decided I was training for it somebody got me an ice bath, and I had done that earlier that week. I'm like, I got this. No problem. It was cold, but not too bad. But we were there, standing there at the edge of the shore, and I reminded them that when Jesus was baptized, God the Father publicly declared, you are my child, and I am pleased with you. And in our baptisms, it's no different. When we're baptized into Christ Jesus and believe in him, we're united in him so that what God the Father said of his son, he says of you and I, You are my child now, and I am pleased with you. And that's something we all need to hear. We need to hear that our Heavenly Father has chosen us. We are His child now and forever. Nobody can take us from Him, and that He's pleased with us. But then something happened that day. 
A transition happened where Jesus' old life was gone, where nobody knew who he was, and now he came into the forefront of what his life was always meant to be, and that is a ministry of seeking and saving the lost, of declaring what he would do on the cross for you and me. And so the first step towards the cross really began with his baptism and his temptation in the wilderness. And then the decision to continue with that commitment to die for you and I happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night when Jesus was betrayed. We're going to take a look at both of those two events to take us on the road to the cross. So what we do here at Grace is we stand in honor of God's word when I read the main passage. So why don't you do that with me? We're going to read Mark 1, 12, and then Matthew 26 and on. So Mark 1, 12. We'll start with the temptation in the wilderness. We will then leapfrog Jesus' entire ministry and go to the end of it. So Mark 1, 12. This is the first step towards the cross. The Spirit immediately drove him, Jesus, out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now we jump ahead three years. Go to Matthew 26, please. One book to the left. Just a few pages, actually. Matthew 26, and we're going to start at 26. Matthew 26, 26. First two paragraphs are going to give us the context, and then we'll get to the garden. Verse 26, listen carefully with me. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the, that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. And now here's our passage. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so you, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. You can be seated. That's called a cliffhanger. And so we're just going to leave that right there and then get to the cross after that. But the start of Jesus' transition into ministry is the temptation in the wilderness. And we read in Mark 1, 12, that the Spirit immediately drove him out in the wilderness. So the minute he's publicly recognized as the Son of God, he then has something that needs to happen. He needs to now go away from everybody, and he has to be in solitude for 40 days in the wilderness while he's fasting from food. The entire time it says this, that as he was in the wilderness, 40 days, he was being tempted by Satan himself. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now, it's something important to understand about Jesus. The scriptures reveal him as God the Son, who is fully God in every way, but he's also fully man. And sometimes we, we emphasize one over the other, and we forget 
the humanity of Jesus and the fact that he was tempted in every way as you and I are. And this is what happens for 40 days. Hebrews 4.15 says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. See, temptation was real for Jesus. He had a real physical body. He really got hungry. He really got tired and probably felt all the emotions of being cranky like you and I get. But he was without sin. And so he was, I mean, I don't know how well you handle not eating, but 40 days of just having water, you're probably not a very pleasant person to be around. I'm just guessing. Okay, some of you can't last missing a meal. And suddenly the blood sugar goes down and everybody starts running. Now Jesus is there being tempted by Satan, and it's interesting that Satan comes when Jesus is finished with his fast, before he is eaten, when he is weakest. Is it not true that temptation comes when you and I are weakest? When we're not on guard, when we're depleted, and we're most vulnerable? We got to be aware of these things. And that's what happened with Jesus. Satan thought that he would have an opportunity to lead Jesus into sin because then God's plan to redeem you and I would have absolutely failed. Had Jesus sinned even once, the death he died on the cross would have been what he deserved, not what we deserved, and we would have died in our sins and been lost for all eternity. So this battle that happened in the wilderness, 40 days long, but the Holy Spirit allowed Jesus to endure extreme temptation for those 40 days. But why 40 days in the wilderness? Think about what you know of the Bible. Think about the Old Testament. Think about how long the Israelites, after coming out of Egypt, when they were baptized through the Red Sea, they passed through. The New Testament calls that their baptism. They entered into a wilderness time where they were supposed to then travel to the promised land, but they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness that was called sin, and they were disobedient and not allowed to enter the promised land because they continued to give in to temptation and disobey the Lord. Is there a parallel here? 40 years and Jesus' 40 days symbolize that Jesus came to do what the Israelites could not do. He was just baptized as they were through the Red Sea. He was in the River Jordan. And instead of walking in disobedience for 40 years, never reaching the promised land, Jesus is the only one who is able to endure all temptation, not sin, enter into the promised land and make it possible for all of us to go to heaven with him. That's what Jesus did in his fight in the wilderness against Satan himself. And what did did Satan tempt Jesus with? Three different temptations we have recorded in Scripture. He's hungry. He's ready to eat. It would have not been a sin for Jesus to eat, but it would have been for him to prove that he was God to Satan and turn the rocks into bread because that's what Satan said he should do. And Jesus said, man doesn't live on bread alone, but by the word of God. He gives the word of God back to Satan to shut his mouth. And then he takes him up to the high point of the temple. Jesus is there and he says, throw yourself down. For God's word says that he will give his angels charge over you and so that you won't dash your foot upon a stone, that they will guard you and protect you, basically. And Jesus says, you don't put the Lord your God to the test, giving him scripture again. And then he takes him up onto a high mountain. He says, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you just bow down and worship me. And he said, you only worship the Lord God. Gave the scriptures again. What's fascinating about Satan's temptation came to my understanding when I was 19 years old. I had just spent six months doing missionary work with a missionary organization in Australia, Indonesia, and Japan. And I was traveling back on an 18-hour plane ride back to LA. And while I was on that plane ride, I was praying about some big life decisions. And I was praying about going back to Australia for a -a two-and-a-half-year commitment because I was asked to help lead a youth movement throughout Australia. Super exciting thing for a young kid. I mean, my pride was like, yeah, I want to do that. But I didn't feel right about it on the plane. I was praying and I was reading a book by Philip Yancey called The Jesus I Never Knew. And in it, he talks about Jesus's temptation in the wilderness. And he talks about what Satan was truly offering Jesus. He was offering a shortcut with no cross. 
Because Jesus was called to rule all the kingdoms of the world, wasn't he? But he had to do it through the cross. And Satan goes, I'll give it to you now without the cross. I'll give you a shorter road, a lesser road for a lesser good. Jesus, you could rule. You just got to bow down to me. And so Satan offered a shorter road for a lesser good, and Jesus showed a longer road for a greater good. And I knew that the short road for me was going back to Australia. The long road would involve more suffering, less recognition, but more glory for the Lord. And on that plane ride, the Lord spoke to my heart, and I wrote it down. The three things were going to happen when I got home. I was going to meet the woman I was going to marry, my dad was going to get sick, and my brother and his wife who couldn't have kids were going to have kids. All three happened. I met my wife. The week we started dating, my dad got diagnosed with ALS. The whole time we were falling in love, he was dying. Um, he passed away a month and a half after our wedding. And my brother and sister got pregnant right before my dad died. Those things don't happen all the time. But that was a pivotal moment in my life because it was a choice to take the longer road that involved more suffering. Many of you know our story and know about how many children we've lost through pregnancy. Uh, my wife and I over the years, um, so many, it, it's hard to count, seven or eight. And the gift of all five of our kids through adoption, which has been God's great story of grace in our family. Those of you who have been walking with us these last two years, I got diagnosed with a chronic form of leukemia and lymphoma, which I'm still going through. And I will for the rest of my life, unless the Lord just decides that it's no longer necessary. Um, but it's something that the longer road that includes suffering is always for a greater good. Jesus chose that for you and me. And he asks us to do the same, to take that road, because it's going to involve a cross. He tells us to deny ourselves, pick up our cross daily, and follow him. But if you want the shorter road, the easier way, it's going to be about you, and it's really going to end in destruction. But if you want your life to matter and count, you're going to understand that suffering is God's great opportunity to, to show his goodness to people through horrible circumstances. That he can shine his glory and goodness through great and difficult circumstances. But there's no greater life than the one lived for the Lord. We're all going to face suffering, but the believer suffers for a purpose, for a glorious purpose in God's hands and kingdom. And Jesus didn't give in to these temptations that Satan threw at him. He chose that wrong, longer road for the greater good because suffering is the greatest teacher in our lives. It even says Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered, and suffering for the believer is an opportunity for you to grow and to show, to grow in your faith and to show God's goodness to others. So don't despise times of testing or trials or difficulty, but endure them as a follower of Christ. Jesus endured them for us, and he asked that we would endure them for him. And I wonder this morning, just in a question of application, as we're halfway through, what road are you willing to take? Are you willing to pray that God would give you the grace to walk that longer, harder road for the greater good? Or do you want the shortcut? I've taken shortcuts in my life. Never works out. I don't care where you are. You're on a trip. You're somewhere else. Oh, this is a shortcut. No, it's not. You always end up going a longer way to the same place. Take the right way. Take the way that the Lord marked out for you and for me. It involves facing temptation and not giving into it. It involves enduring suffering and not quitting because of it. But you need to be willing to face it with the Lord carrying you through it by his grace. Now, Jesus endured that temptation, but then at the end, we jump to the night of his betrayal. 
And let me set the stage. It's three years after Jesus has done signs and wonders, giving people a preview of what life in heaven in the new heaven and new earth is going to be like. No sickness, no disease, all demonic forces defeated, Satan defeated himself, thrown in the lake of fire. All these things are going to happen. Jesus is showing them through all these signs and wonders what life is going to be like in heaven. And then he comes to this night, and it's really a night that he had been dreading. And yet for the joy set before him, he despised the cross, endured its shame, and went to the cross for you and I, scriptures say. So in this last night of his life, the night of his betrayal and arrest, the trap had already been set by the chief priests and Judas himself, one of his closest friends. And really, it happened in six days' time. On Palm Sunday, Jesus comes in to the cheers of all Israel. They think, finally, the king whom God promised has arrived, and they were right. But they thought he was going to kick out the Romans, not kick out Satan. He thought, they thought he was going to live and rule instead of he died and ruled. And so Jesus goes in on a donkey, fulfilling the scriptures. They're all freaking out, huge parade and celebration in his honor. And in six days' time, they're all crying out, crucify him. That's how quick the mob changes. That's how quick popular opinion shifts and changes. Have we not seen it in our culture and society? Person's a hero one day, and six days later, they're the villain. Humanity turns on its own very fast, and that's what happened. We turned on God's only son really quick. And here you have Jesus coming into this situation. The end of the context, he's revealed to be the Passover lamb as he's sitting down with his disciples. This is the day that celebrates Passover when the Israelites were taken out of Egypt. The lamb had to be sacrificed. The blood was placed on the doorway so the angel of death would not kill the firstborn in every family. And that sacrifice of the lamb was to point us to Jesus' sacrifice on this day, on Good Friday. And so he tells his disciples to take the bread for its bo- his body that is broken for them. Drink of the wine for it is his blood. And then he tells them that one of you is going to d- betray me. One of you who dips their bread with me is going to b- betray me tonight. And when that happens, you're all going to scatter. You're all going to leave me. When I need you, you're going to leave. And they're like, no way. And Peter's like, nope, everybody else might leave, but not me. Jesus says, three times tonight, Peter, you're going to deny me. Peter denied that. Isn't that funny? Right? Peter wasn't having it, but Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. But now you have Jesus. He's coming to the garden, and he's going to be tempted by Satan. It doesn't say that specifically, but all of Scripture implies that reality, and I'll show you how. But what we have here when Jesus comes to tempt him is that the garden is significant. And I want you to think about it. Where did sin begin? The Garden of Eden. Where did Jesus face sin once and for all? In the garden. That in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, humanity, Adam and Eve, sinned by taking it. And in the garden, Jesus doesn't take the temptation to save himself. But instead of taking the tree of knowledge of evil, he dies on the tree of life, the cross. Amazing connection that we have there. But I want you to read with me as we come to Matthew 26, 36 is where we're going. But before we get there, I want to tell you this about Satan tempting Jesus in the garden. Is that each temptation in the wilderness three years earlier was for Jesus to prove his identity and display his power at the wrong time. A shortcut with no cross. And this time, Satan is trying to get Jesus to save himself and not you and I. And I could only imagine the things that Satan was whispering to him. They're not worth it. They're not going to love you. They're just going to keep sinning. They're not worth your time. They're not worth your blood. Don't do it. You don't have to do this for them. All the things that he could have tempted Jesus with. But look at verse 36. We're going to go there. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he only takes Peter, James, and John with him, his closest of disciples. And he tells them in this garden of Gethsemane, go sit over there and pray. And what's fascinating about this is Jesus was feeling the strain. 
The cross was already weighing upon him. Our sins were all ready to lay heavy on him, and he needed to know that his closest friends were there. How many times are you going through something and you're feeling the strain of a circumstance or situation and you just need those closest to you around? Do we not need that? He needed them around, but he also needed alone time with his father. And you know it's a good friend when you can have them with you, but they don't have to talk. You can have them with you, but not really right next to you. You can be alone and silent in prayer or whatever, but you know they're there. And Jesus needed both of those, and we see that in his humanity. We need people, and we need alone time. Whether you're an introvert or extrovert, you need to have people close to you who, you, who know you, who love you. You can't isolate yourself from people, but you also need to voluntarily step away from people so you can be alone with your heavenly Father. That's what we see our Lord and Savior doing that allows him to overcome this temptation in the garden. He went away and he needed to pray. Verse 37, and taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Now, the word sorrowful means to be thrown into sorrow. It's like something that comes upon you. You're just thrust into a situation. And I don't know if you've been through certain things in your life, but sometimes you don't know what's coming. You don't know when things are going to hit you. If you've been through a certain tragedy, you've lost somebody you love, or you're going through some medical diagnosis, you'll have moments where you're fine, and the next moment you're just thrown into all kinds of emotions that you weren't ready for. Jesus was thrown into sorrow, and, and it's not a little bit. Exceeding sorrow is what he was thrown to. And it says he was troubled, which means in the Greek, uncomfortable, not at home, and distressed. We have a fundamental human need to feel comfortable, to be at home, and to feel peace. You see, Jesus took the things that make us uncomfortable. He allowed himself to not feel at home. He allowed himself to be distressed so you can be comfortable in his kingdom and in your life right now. That you can not be distressed, but you can be at peace and you can feel at home in Christ. He was forsaken so we could be found. And it's important to know that it's not a sin to feel sorrow or to be troubled in your spirit. If it was, Jesus then sinned. And sometimes we're hard on ourselves when we feel sorrowful or troubled. It's part of life. It's part of what we go through in this life. And we don't have to be overcome by it. We can overcome it as we trust in Jesus who has faced those sorrows and even more. Who's been troubled in his spirit and didn't cower or get crushed by it, but he endured it. So if he did, he can give you the grace you need to endure these things. Now it's interesting that it goes on and says this. Jesus was honest with his emotions. He says, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Jesus wasn't being melodramatic. He wasn't throwing a fit. He wasn't exaggerating. Go, oh, I, you know, when somebody's hungry and they're like, I'm so hungry I could die. No, no, you're not. Nope, you're not. Not even close, Right? I mean, our kids, if they get in trouble, we make them run laps in the back or do burpees. That's why they're all, you know, pretty fit right now. Um, they're doing pretty good. Anytime my boys are like trying to flex on me or whatever, I'm like, I know why you have those muscles. I gave those to you. <laughs> all this running, all those push-ups, that's why they happen. But it's interesting that as we look at these things, and I don't even know why I said that. I'll be honest. Oh, transparency. Jesus was honest with his emotions. I'm being honest with my lack of mental clarity. <laughs> Jesus was honest with his emotional state. Now, as guys, let, let's be clear. We stink in this area in general, right? But then culture swinging to the far side, convincing guys that they have to handle everything like the ladies around them. No, we're created differently. And we're never going to communicate like a lady, and a lady's never going to communicate like a guy. We have vast differences, and it's a beautiful in the differences, and they complement each other. But as, as guys, if we look at Jesus as the perfect picture of humanity, 
he was sorrowful and he was telling his closest friends like, hey, this is bringing me to the doorstep of death. Physically, in my soul, I'm at the verge of dying right now. But if he died, the sacrifice wouldn't have been made. So he had to endure great sorrow for you and I. And he said, remain here. Watch with me. Luke records how sorrowful this became for him. Look at Luke twenty two forty four. And it says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Jesus's sweat pores actually physically burst. So then instead of sweat coming from his pores, beads of blood started to show on the surface of his face and his body and then gather together into bigger drops and begin to fall from his face. Here's what's fascinating. The blood Jesus spilled for us began in the garden because sin began in the garden. Jesus' blood was first poured out in prayer in that garden as he was suffering the torments of hell and temptation because he was tempted to not go to the cross. And he could have chosen not to go. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but when you have to face certain uncomfortable things, sometimes you'd rather bow out especially when it comes to surgery or great physical pain. You're like, mm, I'm good. And it can be anxiety-inducing, fear-inducing. If you know that you're going to go through an extended period of time, a lot of pain, it's like, okay, what can I take or what can I do to get out of this? Jesus went there for you and I because your soul and mine were worth it. And we can't even fully fathom the physical torture and spiritual torment he went through for us. But basically, if you think about all those who would believe in Jesus, all the sins we've committed, and all the penalties and punishment of hell that deserves, all of that multiplied and put on one man, Jesus. That's what he endured for you and me. And so he said, remain here with me and pray. And going a little farther, he fell on his face, prayed, saying, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Remember two years ago when the diagnosis had not been official yet of my um, chronic leukemia, Jen and I found ourselves talking a lot and praying a lot and asking, Lord, <laughs> uh, rather this was not it. And if it cannot be, Lord, then please let it not be what we fear it is. But if it is, may your will be done. May you be glorified in it. He didn't grant our prayer to take it away because the suffering we're going through is necessary right now. And it has a purpose for us, for our kids. I don't want my kids to have to worry about me. But I know that God's shaping them He's making them into who they are called to be. And this is part of the process. And I'm trusting that there's a lot of years ahead. But whatever it may be, Lord, may your will be done. And Jesus, his life was going to be done, but only for three days. <laughs> he knew he was going to raise it in, but that raise again, but that didn't take away the reality of what he was going to suffer. And so he came to his disciples. He found them sleeping again. And he said to Peter, so you could not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You see, Luke tells us that in the wilderness temptation, Satan left Jesus to return again at an opportune time. This is the opportune time where Satan returned to tempt Jesus away from the cross to not give his life for you and I, and yet Jesus overcame that temptation. And then we know from the gospel accounts that Jesus, right after this prayer, the third time, goes away, prays, he gets the answer. He had to drink the cup of suffering. He had to go through the cross. And so then he surrendered himself to the Father's will, stood up, gathered his three friends, and then Judas and the arresting party came. 
Jesus then stood trial, unjustly condemned, handed over Pilate, who tried to let him go. Pilate then condemned Jesus to crucifixion, even though he didn't want to, but the crowd was demanding it, the Jewish crowd. And then they take Jesus. They beat him, flog him, rip open his back with a cat of nine tails, put a crown on his head, beat his face with their fists, pulled out his beard, and then he was so beaten and bloodied, it should have killed him, but it didn't. He then began to carry his cross, his body giving out. They then take Simon of Cyrene, a passerby. They put the cross on his shoulders, Jesus stumbling up the road and up the hill while Simon follows with the cross. They get on top of that hill, and then they nail Jesus to that cursed tree. And he hung there. He hung there for six hours. Be six is the number of man, and Jesus died for humanity. And on that cross, he could have come down at any moment. They even taunted him, Satan, through the crowd, is saying, if you are the Son of God, prove it. The same temptation in the wilderness was the same one on the cross. Prove yourself now. Show us who you really are. Come down off the cross. Don't die for these people. They're not going to appreciate it. And Jesus overcame that temptation on the cross. And he yielded up his spirit to the Father, and he died, and darkness fell upon the face of the earth. The temple curtain was torn in two. Earthquake happened, and all went away, believing those who were right at the cross, the centurion himself said, this truly was the Son of God. And that is what the cross reveals to you and I. Jesus truly was the Son of God. And you could deny that historical fact. You could deny that reality with your life, but you will be on the shorter road that leads to destruction. Or you could acknowledge that fact, that Jesus truly was the Son of God, and he truly died for you. But here's the problem for some people. They see evil in the world, they see suffering, and they conclude that God must hate us or hate me because I'm going through this. If he's real, then he hates me and he doesn't want me or he wants to punish me. But let me ask you this. If God truly hated you, didn't want you and wanted to punish you, why would he send his son Jesus to die for you? He wouldn't because he doesn't view you that way. You might view yourself that way, but he doesn't see you that way. He sees you as being worth it. And I want you to know that Jesus didn't just die generally for all people. He died specifically for those who would believe in him. He specifically died personally for you and for your personal sins. When he died on that cross, him being fully God, I believe that he fully had you in mind. It was personal. It was, the, I am doing this for you and for you and for you and for you. All he asks is that we would receive it. And then the reality of what he did three days later will happen for you and I. He conquered death in the grave. That's why he rose again. The apostle in his letter in the scripture says, if Jesus did not raise from the dead, then we of all people are most to be pitied for our faith is futile and we are still in our sins. If Jesus died on the cross and didn't raise again, we have a dead savior and we have no eternal life. The fact that he rose from the dead, that there's historical evidence over and over and over again shows us that he did what no one else has done for you. He died for you. He rose again for you. But my question for you this morning that I'm going to close with is this. Are you going to take the road that Jesus has picked for you? Or are you going to choose another route? Sometimes we have on our little GPS and our phone directions and we decide that we're smarter than our phone and our directions and it doesn't always go so well how much more foolish is it for us to not believe the one who created heaven and earth and created us to believe that he has a better road and a better way I will tell you when I was 19 and I made that decision to submit myself to God's road for me that was the best decision of my life it wasn't the easiest, it was hardest. And it continues to be hard, but there's no greater life than the longer road for the greater good. There's no greater purpose than knowing that no matter what you are going through, God is going to carry you through it. God is gonna use you to show his goodness and grace and love to others, and that's when life gets really exciting. That's when joy really comes in, and it's not based on circumstances, it's based on the God who loves you. 
American Christianity is obsessed with the easy way that leads to life. That road doesn't exist. Matthew 7, 13, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Ladies and gentlemen, you may not hear this everywhere this morning, but you'll hear it here. The way of Jesus is the hard way and the longer road. It involves suffering, it involves temptation, it involves a cross, but it ends in eternal life. Few people find that way. Not everybody chooses that way to live, but God has called you, destined you, and planned for you to walk that road. And he will give you the grace you need to walk that longer road for the greater good. And I pray that you willingly follow in his footsteps. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and pray. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we just come before you, Lord, and we humbly ask that, Lord, you would take this time of study in your word, that you would plant these seeds of truth and the gospel and eternal life into all of our hearts and minds. And I pray, Father, for your grace upon all who are here. We thank you for all those who are part of our church family who come every week. We thank you for those who are visitors who have come with some of our church family members or just came because they saw the church. We pray, Lord, that you would fill them up by your Holy Spirit, that you would encourage them, that, Lord, if they don't have faith in you, may you give them faith and repentance and eternal life. Lord, may we walk faithfully with you in the coming weeks ahead. I pray, Lord, that we would not waste our life on ourselves, but may we pour out our life for you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. The band's gonna send us out in a closing song, but at the end of this time, I usually like to give an encouragement or a charge or a challenge of some sort. And I just wanna encourage you today that... Jesus showed us what it is to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. He chose the Father's will, not his own. And that is the path to blessing, is choosing God's will for you and putting your own will aside, dying to that. And and I want to encourage you to pour out your life and not worry about running it out. Because the more you pour out your life for Jesus, the more you get in return. You're never going to run out if you pour out your life for him. Use it, all of it. Don't save any of it for yourself. Give all of yourself to the Lord, and that is how you're going to find true joy, happiness, and eternal life that fear has no power over. Amen? Amen. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you all. Thank you for coming.